So this evening, we're going to be talking about uh, problem-based learning. And when we're talking about climate change education and the implementation and the supporting the standards, it's really, you know, from what I've seen in education, problem and project-based learning, what I affectionately call solution-based learning now, and design challenges or design thinking is a really great, and Andrea said it earlier, a great pedagogical or pedagogical strategies to actually do climate change education. And so that's what we're really gonna be talking about tonight. We will go over a few um, uh, theories about problem-based learning, what it is, what it isn't, similarities. Uh, we're gonna do a couple of icebreakers and actually come uh, have some conversation about the pedagogies that you will be talking about. We'll show you a few examples and videos as well uh, and, and examples of your roles as a, uh, a teacher who would be implementing design challenges in their classroom and we'll just show you some strategies along the way. Okay, so, Allison. So we're gonna go right into an icebreaker with a PBL activity here. We're gonna give you a little background uh, relevance. So the impacts from climate change are happening right now and they're extending well beyond increases in temperature. They're affecting our ecosystems and communities in the United States and around the world. So we have a very short, simple scenario. Your school board wants to see the new climate change standards implemented in September. We're gonna put you in a group, uh, or, or should we leave them all here since we're small? We got 12 participants, so. Um, seven, yeah, seven, seven teachers joining us. I mean, I'm happy to join a group if you need, if you need me to, to make four and four, if you no, wanna keep that would be fun, okay. So in our breakout rooms, you're going to have three questions and uh, maybe we can put these questions in the chat I'm not sure if you can see them once you leave the breakout, uh, once you go away and go into your breakout rooms. You're gonna discuss what will your strategies be? What do you know? And what do you need to know? Thank you, Allison. All right, so- um, got everybody back. So anybody wanna comment? Just a couple of things that stood out for you in the breakout session and then we'll move on. Anybody wanna share? I'm, I'm really interested when you mentioned the problem based as opposed to the project based. So I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us. Well, we will get to that. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Out of our group is um, the struggle of avoiding data dumps. Like, that we know the facts and we there's so there's just too much there's just so much information it can be really overwhelming and it's very hard to not just dump data on our students and we know that's not effective but we're but yeah it's hard dump data on them or also look at the other way is the students can kind of differentiate what's important or what's essential which is trivial right what's really important when it comes to climate change when you're doing a lesson versus what isn't so that the students will, and a lot, of the a lot of times it's really best to put it on the students and you as a facilitator, just ask really good questions and facilitate along the way. And I jotted down, understand the why. I love that. That's, that's I think is really, really crucial um, in, in especially this type of work, but especially for youth driven work. And we talked about, you know, trying to be hands off and I know John and Allison are gonna talk lots about that. So I will leave that to them. So you asked about what is PBL. Um, John, you wanna tell them a little bit about PBL and design challenges? Yeah, let's uh, let's bring up the slide deck again and we'll just- uh, we'll Oh, did it go up. away? Oh, uh, yes, okay. Yes, it did. Sorry, thank you. Maybe I need to share my screen. Let me unshare. Okay, so I'm not as good as tech. So everybody else is, there we go. Share from current slide. Good? Mm -hmm. Magic, okay. All right, so, you know, we, we think at least on, you know, from, you know, me being in a classroom and our experience and what I've seen around the state and in other states is like a PBL and design challenges are great strategies for climate change. This is the why. The students deserve it, the world demands it, right? And I just wanna explain a little bit about this slide. When I started teaching, it was the sit and get, what I call the teaching and learning 1.0. And now then, then not to date myself, but you know, then they started to interact with technology when it first started to come in in the 90s. 
Now in the teaching and learning 4.0, when you're doing problem-based, project-based uh, and design challenges, it really needs to be open. You have to have student voice, have to have their choice. It needs to be interactive and collaborative, entrepreneurial and action-oriented. We want solutions from the students. We want them to solve climate change problems. They're, they're gonna be on the forefront of this when they now and when they leave school. And hopefully they will go into careers with this. So that's kind of the why. They're gonna to have to deal with this by our guidance. Not that we're leaving them, you know, we're dropping the ball on them, but they, they really do care about this too. And the other thing about when you're doing PBLs, it really does engage the students because of the content that they're dealing with. They really do get it. Some of the um, students that we've interviewed on a Facebook Live, and we have another one coming up tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, we're asking the students what they think about climate change, and they're kind of blowing us away. So they get it. Okay, next slide. So we're going to ask you some questions. Why do you think PBL is a good strategy for climate action? Any responses here? We mentioned a couple of it. Is there any more that you can think of? Hands on, brains on. Hands on, brains on, hands on, minds on. Yes, good. Anybody okay. else? Let's kind of just dump it out there. It makes them feel part of the solution. Yes. It's engagement. And, and control. They feel like they have some control and contribution and they're not left out of the, it's not just a, a grown up issue. It's an everybody issue. Right. Beautiful. It's Which also is, what has to, like when they're, if they're doing this in their job, like doing projects is what they'll have to do to mitigate climate change. Mm -hmm. it's also, it also reflects real life scenarios so that it prepares them to learn how to work in teams and collaborate and appreciate each other's contributions. Right, we're hitting those career readiness skills. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Shows that these are human problems created by humans and require human solutions. Yes, well said. I think it also offers kids an avenue to hope as well. And it provides, you know, teaching, conservation and environmental issues, which can go dark really quick. Um, <laughs> the ability yes, to- can. Yep, and we all know, we all feel it, um, for it not to feel so overwhelming. Right, uh, being part of the solution and working towards it and taking action gets them out of that negativity, right. But these are all engagement. I always say, if you engage the student, the achievement will follow, just not academically or passing a test, but also in the way and what they could demonstrate they know, be able to, uh, what they know, be able to do and understand. So what do you think is the difference between project versus problem-based learning? <laughs> no wrong answers, give it a step. I feel like a project can be like make a poster about this thing. Mm -hmm. With project. Like a goal. It is a project. A is goal. a poster. <laughs> oh, that's good. But is a poster engaging or exciting, real world? Can it be? Yeah, but it might not be, right? Like the, the problem would be like here, it's more solutions focused, I think. It's more student center too. And it provides them with a mindset that we're working towards something that is going to you know, so in this case, uh, the climate, uh, it changes. Right. Your outcome is not defined. Mm -hmm. In, in a pro project in based, you have an outcome that you would intend to get to. In problem based learning, you don't know what the outcome may be. You don't know what the final solution may be. Mm -hmm. There may be no final solution. And at that point, the students would have to reevaluate and redesign what they originally came up with. So in my view, project-based learning is experiential. Problem-based learning is cerebral. It can be both. It depends, on the, it depends on how the students or where the students take it. Sure. It could be a hybrid. All okay. great answers. Yeah, so, great. So why use team building to foster a community of learners? Why would you want to foster a community of learners in the first place? 
solidarity. Oh, and utilizing different skill sets. Yeah, because we're not all the same. <laughs> we right, all have different right. strengths. Right, right. This one, believe it or not, was one of my my biggest things that I used to use is I used to do some team building activities to find out what strengths the students did have before launching a PBL. Because then you're kind of launching and you don't know who's who. You don't know how they're going to work together. I always did this before, even if it was for one day or 15 minutes or just to get an idea on where they were at. It's very important, the team building aspect of a problem or project-based learning or a design challenge in this case. And I, I mentioned it earlier, the facilitation. And we're going to we'll talk about facilitation a little bit later, but letting go of control is a big one. If you're going to control a PBL, an authentic open-ended PBL, then don't do it. This is a hard one for teachers, this and time on how to control the time because you have limited time during the day. And what do I mean by transparency? Transparency, CYB instead of CYA, because we're professionals tonight. It's authentic. Did you say authentic? Yes. Anybody else? A big part of PBL is making sure that what you're doing in your classroom is transparent to others. I mean, other teachers, administrators, and sometimes even the Board of Education. Don't do it in a bubble. Don't do PBL in isolation. It because looks different too. So if somebody walks in your room and sees you doing real problem-based learning, um, it looks a little like controlled chaos. So getting people to understand why you're doing it this way, that's a big part of the transparency. Yeah. Don't do it in isolation and make sure everybody knows it's around you, your director, your principal, your superintendent and know what you're doing, especially the climate change. We don't, we don't know how this is going to be received in certain communities, the climate change uh, narrative, this climate change education. We don't know that yet. We might have an idea, but you know, we'll have to see how this goes. So transparency, a big one. Selecting a topic. This is also a big one. Teacher selected versus student selected. I've done both where I've actually provided a scenario to them. Maybe you're dealing with students who don't know that much about it and you gotta give them a little bit more background and relevance and you wanna select a scenario and then drop it on them, okay? If, that, if it's an authentic PBL, problem-based learning rather. Or you can actually have the students select what they think is important for them and then you just kinda just work yourself as, around that as the facilitation evolves. So that is another way to do it. I found that the students selected one is good for is a little bit better for engagement because it's theirs now you really got some buy-in ownership because they selected it it doesn't always work out that way um but 90 percent of the time it'll work out okay and then the roles of you know the student versus the teacher's role where it is student-centered it's directed by them and facilitated by the teacher okay next slide And we just said that student center teacher facilitated it, a, a teacher facilitated. And so these are just uh, the most important thing here that you want to know about PBL project and problem because sometimes project can be a hybrid has a little bit of both in it, problem and project. It's just more about the process. It's definitely beyond any steam or other content areas. It goes into many many different areas and failure as part of the process. What a great place for the students to actually experiment and learn by their, their maybe not for lack of a better word, mistakes, but they could recover because they're in a safe place called your classroom. And now, he, and you have a little bit more control over and facilitation, but it's more about the process on this. Go ahead, Allison. This is just a, um, a typical problem-based learning process where the students meet and read and analyze the scenario. Now you can do other things prior 
to dropping just a scenario on them. You can actually do some background and relevance piece. You can have them read articles, read some the books, uh, internet sites, whatever you feel is gonna lay the foundation for the scenario that you're going to create or if they create it. Then they're gonna list what they know about it. They're gonna you know, list what they need to know about it. They're gonna narrow down essential questions. There's specific points. They're still gathering information at this point. And then they're going to analyze the options. They're going to develop action plans. So you can see this evolves into. Now, if you took that triangle and flipped it upside down, right, that would be a project base, starting with whatever the project is on the bottom. And the point goes to a narrow single project, like a poster board, for example. So there is a difference between the two. And of course, applying their solutions could be anything that the students want to do, whether that's creating something, making a public service announce, announcement, making a presentation to the Board of Ed, to their community members, it's whatever they come up with. Within reason, within reason, it's reasonable and manageable. Sometimes the kids are going to bite off more than they can chew, right? It might cost money. That's where you come in as a facilitator. Okay, next slide. Just a couple of you know, what is project-based learning versus problem-based learning? Of course, it's an instructional strategy. They work cooperatively in groups. They create products and presentations. Typically engages students with questions. Creates a final product. Focuses more on the final product than the process of creating it. Next slide. Problem-based learning. Students work cooperatively to investigate and resolve a problem. It's usually based on real world issues or situations. Prior knowledge is involved in that. And the focus is more on the process and problem solving rather than an outcome. Next slide. Both, I should say, both can be motivating or motivating prompt. Usually come into question or problem and has to be addressed by creating a solution or a product. Of course, each is a valid instructional strategy that promotes active learning and engages students. And somebody earlier said hands-on, minds-on. Yes, of course, that is, that is so. Next slide. For those of you who have never seen this, this little cartoon here, the birdhouse is on the right and left. Are they not a project? Is that a classroom project? Yes. Yes, it's a birdhouse. Each one has a, two holes in it with two you know, little dowels for a bird to land. They're probably gonna paint them the same color, but the student in the middle wants to use his creativity, but the teacher's saying, no, 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 okay? He wants to step out of the proverbial box, okay? So project base could be a birdhouse in this case, but everybody's doing the same thing. That's what you don't want with project-based learning. You gotta have some authenticity if you're doing a project and a project-based even more narrow time frame if you're, if you're pressed for time. But most important thing about this slide that I want you to take away is that let your students be creative with their thinking, give them some flexibility and you facilitate the process. I talked about um, creating a, a, a supportive PBL community of learners. And I lost the slide. It's not there. There it is. So when I first started doing PBL, I was just dropping scenarios on them and I was experimenting and I wasn't building a team, a classroom team. This is really important when you're doing this. And of course we're using, we're just talking about pure problem-based and project-based learning and design challenges, but set in the setting of climate change, it's no different. The, the content at this point will, is important, but the process again and pedagogical strategies, keep in mind, are more important. So who's on your team to support? Now, this is not so much your student teams, but who is on your team to support the students and your process for implementing climate change education? And what do you need to succeed? This could be like a checklist to see, because don't you want support from your board of education and administration? Um, maybe they have no idea what you're doing in your classroom. Maybe they have no idea what climate change education is about. And so they have to, they could be on board. 
do you have policy and strategic plan and board, board of ed goals that can support what you're doing in the classroom? So that's what I mean. Who is on your team and what does the team members on your team need to know? What kind of professional development do you need to actually further your climate change education? Is there any funding involved in this? What about school schedule? When you're doing PBL and I talk about time constraints, do you need to adjust the school schedule to get more of it in? I know this might be a little difficult, but if you don't ask, you get. What kind of curriculum? Do you have to change the curriculum? Do you have to rewrite? Who's, do, who's doing that? And how much time are you gonna need for that? Which has to be approved, of course, by the Board of Education. Who's on your community uh, partners and, 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 communica and communications? Who on your community is actually going to assist you with that? And they, what we call it in the STEAM tank, for example, a design challenge is a subject matter experts. Because the teacher, you're not going to know everything. And by the way, when you're doing a PBL or authentic problem-based learning, you're not always going to know the answers. You might know if somebody's doing teaching environmental science, that's, your, that's in your wheelhouse. But what if the students take on something that's in the political realm and you don't know anything about it? Well, that's your subject matter expert. You need to reach out to the community to see who will be on your team to support your students' success. And of course, resources. We have tons of resources in New Jersey. Sustainable Jersey for School has a million resources in there. You know, so I, you have to have them and you have to direct your students to those resources. Bye. Next slide. Yeah, next slide. <clears throat> So we're sharing this with you. Um, John had had shown this to me. We had an older version of it. Um, the, the career readiness skills, they were also updated um, to reflect some climate change back in June of 2020. So if you, if you take a look and read through these, um, a lot of this falls into the same realm as uh, PBL um, and, and what they'll be doing when they actually go to work. So you're acting responsible and contributing to to community members and employees. Um, well, financial well-being, that was just one of them. We wanted to bring them all over. But consider the environmental, social, and economic impacts of your decisions. You're demonstrating creativity and innovation, um, using critical thinking to make sense of the problems and perseverance in um, solving them. Um, model integrity ethical leadership and effective management. Wow, what great aspirations to have. Um, let's see how that works out with teams, right? You're not gonna get there unless you start practicing um, with these team activities. Plan the education and your career paths aligned to personal goals. Okay, so we brought them all over, whether they were specific for climate change or not, but use technology to enhance the productivity, to increase collaboration and communicate effectively, all part of it and uh, work productively in teams while using cultural and global competence. What a great way to achieve these goals by looking at climate change issues. Yeah, they're happening here in New Jersey. Same thing can also be happening on the other side of the world. So it, it's great to, to expand their view and get them at these targeted um, career goals. Has anybody seen these already? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Don, do you have anything on this slide? No, I just think this is important. You know, obviously, this is the reason why we included this in here is be, because it does really align to problem based learning and also a design challenges if, if that's the way you want to, you know, um, work with your students in your classroom. But these are important. We wanted to put the link in this as well, so you know where this new document is. So this wording was taken right out from underneath that grid. Um, there, they said the standards in action climate change. It includes the skills, knowledge, and practices necessary for success in an increasingly complex world in changing natural environment. Climate change is included in all the standards, collaborating to solve a problem, approaching a solution with innovation, and determining the validity of a source of information or all the essential skills required in these standards and necessary for students to possess and maintain awareness um, and successfully address climate change. It, it's amazing right, to me that they are considering climate change on such a deep level in the career readiness skills. It's, this is the kid's future. They gotta be ready for it. Yeah, and a validity and source of information is evidence-based. So 
off the beaten track a little bit from the actual implementation of the standards is currently schools are not required to include sustainable practices or climate change in policy board goals or strategic plans. Kind of need to know that because that's our goal, right? We want to get there so that all schools have something to do with the policies, strategic goals and, and board goals. Um, they have to teach climate change, referred to as previously as environmental hazards since 2009. Uh, the big change is what the expectations across the disciplines, of course, now that it's in seven, seven standards. So it may not be a requirement yet, but strongly encourage it as a strategy. So as part of your strategy for you, you may not be the one that's leading the strategy on the board level, but know that it's just not about implementing climate change education in your classroom. It is a district wide, hopefully we will get there at a district level so that the, the, the standards are supported by policy and by strategic plans and by board goals. I don't know how many of you realize that climate change was in the original 2009 next gen science standards. Um, it was, you, if you caught it in the very beginning, early before they were changed to the New Jersey student learning standards, climate change, the wording, it was in there and it was weaved through. When they changed it to the New Jersey student learning standards, they changed the wording and called it environmental hazards. So that was the political arena back then. Now we're free to call it climate change. Um, people were confused when you called it environmental hazards. So they didn't understand what you were talking about, what environmental hazards. So now it's it's much more clear. Super fun sites. Lots of those in New Jersey. <laughs> so Another, knowing your obstacles, it doesn't matter, John, if you no, want to. Go ahead, Allison. So knowing your obstacles, um, you want student success when they're doing this PBL, when they're doing climate change work. Um, think ahead about what could prevent your students from implementing real world climate change solutions. We use action plans with our, with our students in our programs to help them think through um, why, what, who, when, where, how much. So having something formal like that, them thinking through each of these steps, it's gonna help them achieve their success. But what do you think? What are some things that could be preventing you or your students from, from coming up with solutions? What are your issues now? Or what do you foresee being issues in your district or in your classroom? Anyone? Anyone? Well, my students sometimes is a language barrier. However, I've noticed that there's a lot of, of the cognates between uh, Spanish and English when it comes to science. So, you know, it's a, it's a good way to empower them to know that they're bringing prior knowledge if they can uh, make an association between ciencia and science or clima, climate, but, but it is definitely uh, a deterrent uh, sometimes for them when they don't have the language skills mm. to explore more and to share ideas. Is that in a form of resources? Um, can I play the fifth? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like I, I'm a true believer in bilingual education and I think that promotes uh, critical thinking Skills. And like I said, it, it encourages students to, to feel that they have more to offer, that they're bringing more to the table. But sometimes that's not really the, how my ESL program that my district implement may not have the same views that I do. So I'm, I'm limited to how I can incorporate you know, a bilingual approach, so. One strategy is to get the students involved in that change. Anybody else? Yeah, sure. Uh, so one problem, I'm not K through 12, I'm higher ed, but still one of the problems that I see is a breakdown in imaginability 
ability to imagine outside the box, lateral thinking. Mm. That's really tough. I'm so glad you said that. I see that too in high school and uh, not not from everybody, but a general like attitude of like, I, I'm not doing it right. Or just like, tell me what to do because they've maybe been conditioned to learn that way um, or like lack of focus. Like, okay, you're in your group and then it's just to like talk about something else or like not enough um, structure for some of my students to stay focused. And then on my end, uh, I would really love to have <laughs> some of these project-based problems just handed to me so I can implement them instead of make them up. I have a lot of PBL scenarios if you wanna email me. I'll share them with you. I have like 13 pages of just scenarios that you could use. A lot of them are environmental. I would love that. Thank you. I think something that's really challenging at the elementary level is the fact that um, a lot of elementary teachers don't necessarily have the knowledge background and the depth in um, in understanding climate change as a, as a big issue to be able to feel okay with that organized chaos. So while I have a, a you know a background in conservation biology, many in many elementary teachers have a background you know just in general education, and so it doesn't lend itself. I mean, I have trouble just with like science overall, much less something that is nuanced like climate change. So I really feel like I struggle with convincing somebody that they, as an adult, that they have the ability to you know, lead kids in this charge. Mm -hmm. Good point. Anybody else? Uh, basically the same thing that was mentioned earlier. I think Carly said it, um, but yeah, lack of exe um, low executive, lack of executive function in some of the students and some of the students and the focus, but, and um, just the, burden on us of designing the problem-based solutions, of designing these, prob these kinds of problem-based um, exercises. And then um, just one thing that I always think about, that I was thinking about is um, how to, is this something really mundane? I mean, as much as I don't like grading and don't think assigning numerical values to things is a good practice, yet it's something we're asked to do. And uh, how to go about doing that aside from just participation which I mean, okay, I'm cool with that, but yeah. So in other words, they're asking you to grade the students on a test, right? right. Versus performance-based assessment, right. which is what you would use for project and problem-based learning. Both, you could do both. You have to do both. But even for a performance-based assessment, like how would, how would a rubric like that be designed and implemented? I mean, I could show you some rubrics that, that I've done you know, again, my, my uh, Renee was kind enough to put my email in there and I'm happy to get on like, a you know, another call. We can actually video conferencing with Allison. We could be part of that and, and just talk through that because this is, you know, you're building these PBL lessons, if you will, or activities, and it may be different and it may be challenging. And the other thing too, is the students are not used to this. So the other challenge that you might, or an obstacle is students are not used to this particular kind of uh, strategies that you'll be kind of trying out on them. I've had some students in the past that were resistant to this, where they, they just wanted to take a test. I've had students drop out of my class because it wasn't just a test and they knew they could pass the test because they could memorize the content. That's not what this was about. They actually had to do the work and be engaged and, and talk to each other. And some students just did not want to do that. So you have a you have a change too in the way that the students perceive what you're trying to do. Then, you know, Carolyn, you mentioned before, they don't even know the content. So you have to do baby steps. And the other thing about PBL is you can't start with a big problem-based learning. S start small, start mm -hmm. really small. Like uh, my, my simplest environmental PBL was paper or plastic. That was the scenario. And the kids, and I've said, okay, 15 minutes, what is this, what do you think? And they would say, well, what does he mean? Does he mean paper or plastic at the grocery store? 
what's more environmentally friendly or does it mean credit card or cash? Like, what does he mean? You know, and they would have the conversation. So you do bits and pieces of the PBL. You don't have to do the whole thing. Maybe you just do a, you drop a scenario on them just as a brainstorming activity and then you're done in 15 minutes. You let them warm up to the idea. Otherwise you could potentially crush the students. Can I say something, John? I, I find it that since we are so uh, such an assessment driven um, society, uh, bringing problem based projects always brings a conversation from other teachers or principals to say, well, how are you assessing them? How do you know that they're getting it? And uh, so that the, the assessment aspect of it is always something that I find challenging to justify what we're doing. You know, well, how do you know? How do you measure success? Yeah, you show, the students will show what they know in a project or problem-based learning, right? That doesn't mean you don't test them or quiz them the traditional way, which I don't like that much when you're doing this because you really want them to explore and have them be hands-on and build and create and design and, and use their imagination as Ash just mentioned earlier. That's all part of this, all right? But you know, to get them to that level of assessment where you can actually have them, and, and by the way, we talk about engagement. If you engage that student, they're gonna be able to explain it back to you what they're doing and the going back to the why. And so, can that be converted into an alignment of a standard and a quiz? Yes, you have to do what we call a crosswalk. So you have to crosswalk from the actual scenario and, and the, you know, the hands-on stuff that you're doing, alignment to the standards, and, or you could do it the other way around. You can say, this is the objective, the students will be able to know, be able to do and understand by the end of this lesson, and then put the, put the standard alignment and then work kind of backwards. So starting with the end in mind, you know, so, Yes, you can, but you can need time as a teacher. This is where professional development would come in. You need more training on that on how to actually design these things and do the crosswalk to the standards. John, I remember you telling me when you first started doing these in your classrooms, it was a Friday. It was a PBL Fridays. Yeah, PBL Fridays, yeah. And so it wasn't, so you can see you, you would do your traditional teaching Monday through Thursday, and they know that Friday, it's PBL Friday. It looks different. It's gonna feel different. You can use a rubric with it. They're gonna get um, assessed differently on those Fridays. And that's where the rubric comes in. And John, John can share it. We can do a separate session where we show you a copy of a rubric and they can see um, each of the areas that you're looking for to show um, you know, how they're performing in the team. Um, you know, they, what their roles were, did they cover each of these things? Um, and, and, you know, what you're looking for to, sh to prove that they've done each of those things. But he introduced it slowly. So he said, we're gonna try PBL Fridays and it's probably not gonna be, it might not be the biggest hit the first time or it might not go at all the way you were planning, but you can go back the next week and it, it can be a newer um, PBL. You know, and um, don't expect the large project maybe in the beginning, start small so that you can celebrate their success, give them their feedback and, and tell them what you saw that was working. Um, thanks, but thanks I don't want to give everything me. away. Yeah, Go thanks ahead. for reminding me about that, Allison, because the other thing that came along with that is I actually had to have a permission form that I sent, that I created and sent home to the parents telling them that your student is going to be participating in what's called problem-based learning and it's gonna look and feel differently. I had to send stuff home to the parents because a couple of the kids, parents were freaking out because they weren't being tested the same way. So that's where I, the, this, the CYB, cover your butt and transparency might also come with permission forms explaining to the parents and also you explaining it to the administration that you would like to do this particular kind of pedagogical stuff, strategies in your classroom with climate change education. Everybody has to know what you're doing, including the parents. They're not excluded from this equation. But I know we're, we're, we have a little bit of time left, like, but I wanna move on a little bit. So we have a few more things that we wanna share. So we're gonna transition from problem-based learning and there's some similarities 
to also what is a design challenge. And so this really, you know, it, it blends multiple content areas in a way that students can understand the meaning of, now this is important, the theoretical academics that we teach in the classroom and transform their understanding into practical applications of real world problem solving. Again, creativity, innovation, and even entrepreneurial that's relevant to them. And this is where you become the architect of the lesson plan and you have to really know your students what's relevant and meaningful to them. It's usually initiated in the form of a project where students follow the design engineering thinking process. Next slide. A great way to start if you're looking for material is using a design thinking with sustainability in mind and using the UN sustainable, sustainable development goals. We've included these links here. If you haven't looked at this, you might wanna check these out. And also what's called project drawdown. Great place to look for a lot, a lot of things that are going on with what can be done in climate change. It's really nice to share this resource with your students, uh, especially your older students. The younger ones might need a little handholding, but the older students should be able to handle this. And, and please feel free to check these out on your spare time. Another great place to get ideas for scenarios and design challenges is right in your local community. Lorna earlier said, play, you know, like place-based learning, schools, a building as a teaching tool or, or a living, living textbook, the grounds outside, the community, every town, every community has environmental issues. And you just have the students explore what they are. So it's a great place to start, but if you wanted to expand out globally, these are great resources. Next slide. I don't know if you've seen this before and in the education you may, and PPL and design challenges really hit the 90% and, and, and the retention rate, average student retention rate with the learning pyramid is they're usually, when they're usually engaged in a design challenge or PBL, they're teaching others and their retention rate goes up. So we're gonna bring this back to them passing a test, right? Well, if they're engaged and they're teaching others, then they're gonna learn the material and they should be able to, again, achieve higher on tests because they get it, because they were able to share it. This goes for adults too. When you're asked to teach others, you know your content, right? You're gonna be in front. Like if I didn't know what I was doing right now, you would know it, right? And, and I would, I'd have to learn it if I wanted to teach it well. Next slide. So this is a group of girls called the Trapasquitos. Um, they took part in quite a, in a couple challenges, um, including Eco Schools, which is one of the pro I didn't talk about it earlier, but that's one of the programs I oversee in New Jersey. Um, they also participated in John's program, the the Steam Tank. But I wanted to bring them up front because of the teaching others. So they chose a problem on their own. Um, they knew with climate change that there was going to be um, increased temperatures and ultimately a rise in insect-borne illnesses because you don't have that winter snap to kill them. So that was, and Zika was in the news. So I'm dating this project a little bit, but that's what was at the forefront of these girls' minds. Across the street from their school, um, they're in a very urban environment. They're in Jersey City. There's a reservoir behind a giant brick fence that nobody can see unless you go into it, but it's no longer used. So, um, Nature took it back and the, the teacher was using that to inspire ideas for the students to come up with programs. So thinking about Zika um, and, and the warmer, wetter conditions that are gonna happen with climate change in New Jersey, they decided they were gonna create a trap for mosquitoes. Um, they used the engineering design process. They kept improving on their design. They were using to draw the mosquitoes into this trap. They had rotting fruit at the bottom and the CO2 that was coming off that fruit is what was attracting um, the mosquitoes. And they had PVC pipe they had drilled holes into. They kept um, looking at the results to see how many bugs did they collect, what else did they get besides mosquitoes, figuring out how to make you know, the design better by making the hole smaller, bigger. They, they attached a fan to draw in mosquitoes from a larger circumference. They kept improving on their design. Um, and once they really got it the way they wanted it, they taught other students from other schools in other countries how to build this same design. So John, I'm gonna give back, I'm gonna stop sharing. We're gonna show you their presentation from Steam Tank. So 
So now, Allison, the pressure is really on if I can actually pull this off and share my screen. Nobody got mad at me and I messed up a lot, so we're good. All right. All right, I think I got it. So this is at our uh, at the school board's uh, workshop. This was uh, going back a couple of years ago, but this is them explaining what the Trapezoidal is. <laughs> Hi, we're here with uh, two students uh, from two different high schools, but they went to the same middle school. Uh, and they're going to explain their project, which I think we're all going to need. Uh, they're from uh, McNair High School and also High Tech, but introduce, introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Karen Ayou. And I'm Leali Soleil. And we're the Trapasquitos. Trapasquitos. Where did, you're in different high schools right now. But where did you, st you started this a couple of years ago. In our middle school, Chris McAuliffe in seventh grade, yeah. So this is a project that's almost two years in the making. Yeah. And Trapezoidal, what is that? So this is based, this is our Trapezoidal Junior. It's a miniature version of our final prototype, the global Trapezoidal. But basically what it is, is we put our um, compost inside the bucket and it gives off CO2 and heat. We worked, we did several trials to get um, the perfect the perfect compost ratio that would give off enough CO2 and heat to attract mosquitoes. We give off CO2 and heat as humans. That's why mosquitoes are attracted to us. And that's why we decided to use compost for the trap. And there's um, a CO2 and heat outgassing tube that's supposed to be um, that's supposed to like release the compost, the CO2 and heat coming from the compost to the entrance of the trap. So there's a tube coming from there here. And um, there's a fan in here. We use a computer fan. Um, we recycle a computer fan like this, and it goes inside our, three, our custom 3D printed motor mount, and that's the entrance of the trap there. Um, for the fan to be able to suck in the mosquitoes, um, what I did was I switched the wires around, the negative and the positive, so it would go inwards, and it would suck in the mosquitoes. And we also um, put a mosquito collection area directly under the fan. It's um, made of just netting placed directly under the fan to catch the mosquitoes. Yeah, and, and we it, started this project because of the rapidly spreading Zika virus along many of the diseases oh, okay. that carry. And we're actually the first in the world to utilize compost as a mosquito attractant. That is a great idea. I don't even have to ask you whether there's a need to get rid of mosquitoes because I will buy one. I will promise that once you have it developed. I just want to and discount, we're, though. We're actually trying okay. to make it marketable. That's why we, our original trap was about $400. Uh -huh. But with the Trap Mosquito Junior, we're trying to get it under $100, which we have done. Yeah, okay. we're trying to make it affordable for office spaces and backyards. And so it's available for everyone. So this took, uh, I can see you put a lot of work, a lot of thought into it. You had to give a presentation in front of the, the judges. How do you think you did? Um, so we've done a lot of community outreach. We've done, um, we've collected compost from like farmers markets. Dunkin' and Donuts even, we yeah. utilize their coffee grounds. Outside, I think I'm gonna stop it there. Um, you get the general idea on what their project was about. And you can see that they had a lot of different um, not only engineering, but they had the marketing, they want to get it out, they had communication skills, they had to present in, um, in front of the steam tank judges. Uh, obviously, they did quite well because they placed very highly in the, in the finals. So, um, anybody have any comments about that? What's your reaction? Fantastic. Just absolutely what you, what you want to see young people think about and problems you want them to solve. Amazing. So I guess the point here is it can be done, right? And if you, the students were using, the, in this case, it was more place-based and it was definitely an engineering design process going on here as well. So they kind of did a hybrid. They solved a problem, a real world problem right in their own local community. They shared it with others. They want to market it. They want to be entrepreneur, they're entrepreneurial about it. So a lot, a lot of great things that were involved in that particular one. We have literally hundreds of presentations of like this with students who are coming up with solutions. And this happened to be a really good one because like uh, yeah, his name is Ray Penny, who was interviewing him, said that nobody likes the idea of mosquitoes. Everybody, that's a problem. So that was a big one. John, do you want to show the other example? Yeah, they scored very high. Yeah. Okay.
We're here uh, at NJA's conference. Uh, this is the finals of the Steam Take Challenge. Uh, with me from Manasquan High School uh, is the EcoCast Chilling System. And I want you to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Rachel Wall. We're uh, both seniors from Manasquan High School. I'm Jane Hamilton. Okay, uh, why don't we bring in your uh, prototype? And why don't why don't you tell us what it is? Sure. So we created the EcoCast chilling system, which uses gravity to um, inflate and deflate a bunch of small pouches within the cast, which will account for swelling. So simply when your arm, we, we targeted the arm specifically. So when your arm is really swollen, you will need a bigger cast so it doesn't cut off circulation from the cast. So you simply will just deflate the um, pouches when you need that. So you, the pouch just has to be higher than the IV when you want to deflate it. And simply the pressure will go down and it's just simple gravity. So you would just hold your arm higher than the IV you hook up. And then when you want to inflate the cast because the swelling has gone down, your cast becomes loose and you lose stability of it. And you simply lift the IV higher than your arm would be. And it starts to inflate. And this will allow for compression of the arm. And this can also be used for muscle atrophy, which is when your uh, muscle mass goes down and decreases because you haven't used it for a while, which occurs when you have a cast on because obviously you, uh, it's immobilized, mm -hmm. so you can't use it. So towards the end of your time in a cast, your muscle goes down and your cast becomes really loose, which um, affects your healing process. And what's the, another advantage to this if it's cold? Um, so typically when you get a cast, uh, you're supposed to ice the arm, but when you have a cast, it's difficult because your arm is casted. But with our pouches, it'll allow for you to chill the arm, which will decrease swelling and help with the overall healing process. Now, I was very interested to see how you, what spurred this idea, because I remember last year your school actually did an eco cast, but what's the impetus for all this? Yeah, so last year, um, my team and I created the EcoCast, which is where this idea came from. When I was in fifth grade, I broke my one leg, and in sixth grade, I broke my other leg. So I thought of a way that we can reduce all the waste that casts produce because they're not decomposable. They just sit in landfills. Right. So that was last year's project with the EcoCast, 100% biodegradable cast. Now this year, we decided to go for swelling because I had the problem with my legs swelling up at different points of my casting process and having to figure out how to stuff ice packs in right. there. And um, when my leg finally shrunk from muscle atrophy, how it was really unstable. So you're... So I'm going to stop it there, but again, you get the general idea. Any comments on that? If not, we'll move on. But so wait, could... wait, John, just so they know, what are the three questions that you set up so that they can see both projects from the same three questions, two totally different results. What so we actually have them in the slide deck, but I'll, I'll definitely share them now. So in the steam tank uh, challenge, um, obviously everything that they do, whether they design, create, build, invent, whatever has to be sustainable and they have to address sustainability and climate change. Um, and they get invent something new that doesn't exist yet. They have to um, modify an existing product to make it better and then solve a real world problem that needs resolution. That's all the students get. The teachers get a playbook and it's a pretty lengthy playbook with tips and tricks and problem-based learning and design challenge um, information in there, but that's all the students get and they start going. And so um, some of them have projects that are in the making already, but a lot of them just come in and say, okay, what's their concept for this? And then they start from scratch. So we get kind of a mixed bag with that. So the, I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but this is actually really important with the six engineering habits of mind. And, and, and you know, we talk about creativity, the collaboration, communication, optimism. When we're talking about climate change, we want to be optimistic about this. Again, attention to ethics and really important is systems thinking. Because when you're talking about uh, solutions with climate change, we don't want the quick fix short term. We want long term you know, kids have visionary outlooks towards solving a problem 
And that really, really has to look at systems thinking and like even life cycle assessment. So the, if you're not familiar with this, you know, you can look this up, the six engineering habits of mine. Um, really, I think really good stuff and should be included or at least paid attention to. These are just some fundamentals to include when you're moving forward with a design challenge in your classroom. Of course, maybe you're familiar with this. This is, just, this is a typical classic engineering design process where they identify a problem. At least this is, these are frameworks for students to follow. So there are some structure. So unlike a very open-ended like steam tank where they only get three things to, and there's no structure, it's all them. This is more structured and they can follow this. It's good. And you as the instructor have to decide which one of these, or if you want to use a hybrid, ones to follow. If you need more structure, this is also a good one. Next slide. Yeah, we saw those, okay. This year, the, the steam tank is, is, is virtual. We have 354 teams that are gonna be participating. We thought that was pretty good for a COVID year, we'll take it. Last year, we had over 660 applications for a steam tank, and, um, but you know, 354 virtual for the first time, and it's kind of exciting. So why do PBL design challenges? It really sets the stage for addressing authentic real world situations that contain human needs and provide students opportunities to experience <laughs> definitely SEL and empathy. They do pay attention to this. We talked about you know, practicing the necessary soft skills with the, you know, the career readiness practices. They have they heavily, heavy on problem solving. We work collaboratively their creativity and imagination. They're using all this. They're thinking like entrepreneurs. We need to re-engineer our world when it comes to climate change and using their imagination and creativity is gonna get them there. And these are just frameworks for them to get there as well. Having ownership of all or parts of the project, designing and building something, they're all part of it. So that's why we do these design challenges in PBL. Next slide. So. This is building PBLs and design challenges. What we did is we put these slides together just as kind of guides. We're gonna go over them kind of quickly because I wanna just make sure we have room for questions at the end. Um, you have to decide what's the role. Uh, will you create and direct and control it all? Okay, facilitate it and let go as we talked about earlier. And you can see in the picture here, like now this teacher is on, on this picture right here in the top right. He's on the ground with the student they're building is something versus somebody just up in the front of the room where the kids are statically sitting in their seats. Now, this might reflect good teaching in some schools, and this might be, he might be giving them instruction and then they break off into, into groups or do the PBL, I don't know. But letting go and facilitation is something that you as a teacher are gonna have to kind of get used to. Are you gonna create hands-on, minds-on environments? So that means the environmental setting or the environment, the actual classroom setting as well. Assist with obtaining subject matter experts, communicate, include, and be part of the challenge itself. Many, many times when I did PBLs with the students, I had no idea where they were going with this because it was out of my league in terms of content knowledge. And I became part of the team. Next slide. I'm not going to show this because of lack of time, but if anybody wants to go on and look up Forrest Bueller's, uh, the, the movie Forrest Bueller, Today Off. This is where the teacher asked, is asking the students something about voodoo economics, and he's boring the students to death. And the one scene where the students has his head on the desk when he's actually drooling. So this is not good PBL, not good teaching. This is not interactive. It's not creative. You don't want to do this as an instructor. And of course, we talk about building trust and creating a community of learners. This is a big part of that. We already talked about this, so we're going to move quickly through this. It's a really great first step when you're designing PBLs. What type of design challenge will it be? Will it be open-ended, like I just explained with Steam Tank, student-directed and teacher-facilitated? Is it going to be teacher-created and teacher-directed? Narrow focus, but teaches a specific area of need. This is not, none of these are bad things. It just depends on your individual situation. If you wanted to keep it narrow focused because you're teaching a specific climate change standard, that's a good place to start. A smaller, narrow focused PBL, getting the students used to it. Next slide. Hopefully the topic will be relevant and meaningful to the student. 
obviously it has to be aligned to the standards and you have plenty of standards for climate change that are out there now. Doable and manageable. You as the facilitator of whether it's a PBL or a design challenge have to decide whether what the students are going to select as a project or a solution is doable and manageable. You don't wanna crush the students by them taking biting off more than they can chew. So that's a conversation as a group that you can have with the students. And you may redirect them to have something smaller unless you think it's doable and manageable. Is the topic selected by the teacher or the student or both? Many times I did that where we both selected something. Is it real world? Always helpful. Are you improving something? And you, are you helping people? And that actually hits the um, SEL. Next slide. The physical space is also important. Do you have enough supplies? Do you have enough money? Do you have enough storage? Do you have enough access to technology if it's needed? Do you need any special equipment like 3D printers or some other kind of technology that you don't have and that you would like to have? And maybe that's something that you put in your budget for based on the projects that the students select. Oftentimes I tell teachers when they're doing these open-ended projects not to put in $2,000 for their budget and, and if they had, let's say if they had $2,000 for their budget and they were gonna spend that money on all the kind of supplies, but they didn't know what the student projects are gonna be. You could reverse that and have, wait until the students are actually going to do a project and then put in what the supplies and what the things they are based on the need. That's just a reverse way of doing it. Next slide. Know your obstacles. We talked about this a little bit earlier at the time. Uh, obviously safety could be an obstacle. Are you going to, are the kids going to be building or having something hands-on and you don't have the, your credentials? How are you going to have them build a prototype if you are not certified for them to work with small, even small hand tools and machines? So you have to figure that out. And again, not being able to bring the challenge to completion is a do, that's the doable and manageable. Budgets are going to be a problem. What about colleagues? What about if you're the rock star in your class and the kids are all engaged and they really like what you're doing, but you're shaming the other teachers, that can happen. Mm -hmm. That was a problem when I was in the classroom where I was doing this way out stuff. I was running electric vehicle programs and the other classroom teachers like, oh, come on, John, really? Like, really? Just close your door and just do what we're doing. That's not me. So if this is going to be you, include your colleagues. Parents, including parents, transparency, include your administration. If they're obstacles, make them part of the solution. Next slide. Your administration and board of ed, have they visited your classroom and understand what you're actually doing? Okay, maybe invite them in. It's not up to the board to run around a school. That's not their job. But if you invited them in or have the students made a presentation, they now understand that you're doing something very, very big called climate change. Created and approved by the district's uh, STEAM policy, if you're, if you're doing it, something with STEAM related, or if you have a sustainability policy, same thing. Include iSTEAM as a board goal. There's a lot of these projects when we talk about design and engineering is STEAM related, but of course it has the sustainability overtone in it. Communicate it to the public and the innovative work that your students are accomplishing. These are Again, keeping it positive, these are feel good kind of projects. The students are working on some real world stuff like the Trapasquito. And how cool would that be? And how cool and how proud the parents would be knowing that their students did something like that and solved a real world problem. Next slide. So this is the, uh, I don't know if we have time for this. We probably don't, but this is the Steam Tank Challenge. We were gonna have you do a small, like five minute, like identify a real world, you know, uh, sustainable problem or situation that needs resolution. What do you think, Allison? I don't think we have time for this, do we? Um, no, I think we go through the ahead. No, okay, well, but just, this is actually, we've done, Allison and I have done uh, professional development with teachers where we actually drop this on the teachers and they have to come up with some stuff, uh, whatever they decide, and they're pretty good. We've often thought about having a steam tank for, for teachers because they got some really great ideas. That's in another life, so I don't think we have time for that or capacity, but next slide. Yeah. Okay, um, oh, okay. I threw this in here. Um, so I work with EcoSchools USA. It's a hybrid program. It's where um, they, they first have the experience of identifying the problem through an audit 
And then they do the project by creating an action plan. So it's a little bit of both PDLs. Um, and I'm gonna show you some examples where students were focusing on climate change and its impacts on human health. So sea levels are rising um, at, in New Jersey at uh, twice the global rate. You see here two examples of schools who took on this problem. One, the top is um, Sandy Hook, students at the Marine Academy of Science and Technology. Um, Superstorm Sandy came in and washed away their large dunes that have been protecting their beaches. And the students realized that what holds those dunes together is the sea beach amaranth. And it only set seed um, every once in a while. So they had to actually go and get those that actual sand that washed inward that had the seeds to bring it back and reform the dunes and stabilize them. So this was a student project um, all around climate change and what's happening to their area. At the bottom, this is students from the Cape May Votech. That bridge is behind marshland that their school is adjacent to. So they have the good fortune of a boat that they use as part of their learning. Um, they can't reach their boat when you have these high tides, which is happening more and more often. So they teamed up the environmental studies, uh, teamed up with the engineering studies students, and they were looking into new materials for a floating pathway. So here's just two examples of how students can, can get involved. Um, so rain gardens, yes, that's tons of fun and definitely um, big with the elementary school students. On the left-hand side, they're citing an area that stays wet. Um, they came up with solutions. Students on the upper right, they actually, that's their courtyard. And so they built these pipes that would take the water out of their courtyard. They learned how to do this as part of their project. Um, on the bottom left, we have students up in Bergen um, teaching other students about um, why native plants are important and how they can um, hold on to and clean soils. And so they have three different plants and they're, they're showing how the water runs through the root systems. Because what's happening in New Jersey is we're having new rain patterns. As it gets warmer, it can hold on to more moisture. Um, so we're getting more intense storms and more of them. It's getting harder to breathe as things get hotter. Um, we're going to have more asthma and that is one of the biggest reasons kids with asthma miss school and they miss a lot of it. The CDC says that they're missing about 5 million school days a year. So a teacher um, by the name of Albert Padilla, who was um, in Jersey City, he came to one of our trainings um, several years ago. Um, New Jersey Audubon is the largest conservation organization in New Jersey and that's where I work. And we taught them about how lichen in this upper left-hand picture is an indicator of air quality. Um, he brought that back to his students. They went walking around their urban school looking at street trees and identified lichen on the trees. And it got them thinking, okay, if this is the air quality outside, what are we breathing in our school? So they did tests um, and they created their own air filters out of recycled materials. That's what you're seeing on the bottom here. Um, and then they created an anti-idling campaign in their school. So here's um, kids taking action for improving their own health. Um, this is just a final slide going over eco schools that serves about 330 schools in New Jersey that are participating in this program that's a hybrid between the two PBLs. John, if you want, we saved six minutes. I think we can take five to do this. You're, I can't hear you. Unmute. Or maybe can we, if anybody have questions. Let's, let's then, take some questions first. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. All right. So uh, anybody questions? I, I mean, I know this was uh, kind of a lot of information, but I'm going to stop talking. What questions do you all have? All right, well, then I will talk, keep talking then and I will throw out there, but please interrupt me if anybody does have a question. So these were lots and lots of great and and uh, between John's examples of projects and how and, and Allison's examples of especially of student projects in, in whether it was the um, 
well, Trapeskitos or, or these final ones were all projects that mattered to the students. And the students you know, chose these projects because it was interesting to them and it, issues that mattered to them. So going back, they were able to understand the why, right? So they were able to really get engaged, which John and Allison talked about a lot and, and thinking about how as the educators, we need to step back and encourage these interests and encourage the student kind of problem solving mentality, kind of figuring out what will, you know, the problem is we can't get to our boat anymore. What are we going to do about it? Those types of ideas, um, you know, or, or our air quality is so terrible. So what do we need to do anti, you know, anti idling campaigns. So these are all like really great ways of how students are kind of initiating action and through whether it's, uh, you know, PBL, PBL, as I know John likes to call it solutions-based learning. These are all, all kind of some initial strategies for allowing the students to think about. And, you know, whether it's the transparency and, and finding support and allies for you as an educational, you know, kind of support, but also that you can be the, you know, the cheerleader for the students, I think is, is a really important component here that, um, for those of you who are are in the in our geographic area that can participate in the climate action contest and you know got all my fingers and toes crossed that this expands year statewide next year um you know i think i think these are some really you know kind of interesting ways of thinking about how we can bring it into the classroom but there's always you know earlier talking about challenges and i always think time and money is always what comes to my mind um but any other questions or or comments or, or anything from everyone before I close out? I just wanted to make a comment and I think John alluded to it about looking for like subject matter experts or looking for help in the community, especially when it comes to climate change related work. Um, there are a bunch of different groups and nonprofits um, that are working on these types of things in their communities. So kind of reaching out to their local green teams or the, you know, the P P Pinelands Preservation Alliance, the Rutgers Cooperative Extension, there's just tons of different resources. And um, also, and they probably, they probably know this already, but just everything that's on uh, the research that you can do online to find toolkits and guidebooks and instructions on how to build a rain garden or what whatever it, it is. So kind of doing the research and making the connections. If you know if you're doing and that's not necessarily it's a little bit different if you're doing a design challenge, but for like an action project like Allison was talking about, just kind of making the connections and doing the research will help significantly them kind of being able to focus on what they can do. Well, we're resources. Okay. You can reach out to us as you're, you know, going down this road with your students. Um, we're happy to meet with you again, join you on another webinar, or just talk to you, um, you know, in a quick Zoom session. So reach out to both of us, either of us, um, we're happy to talk you through it. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Fabulous. Well, um, if anybody does have questions, feel free to hang around. I have like my my little spiel here at the end, but um, I am dropping into the chat right now the link to the feedback and evaluation form. But on behalf of our program partners, of course, Sustainable Jersey, who Renee was just um, you know, is our representative here tonight, along with Heather McCall, um, but also the Drum Thwacket Foundation, Atlantic City Electric, and the Exelon Foundation. I want to thank you all very much, as well as our wonderful speakers, um, for participating in today's session. It, I think it was, you know, so many different ways of thinking about how students can do something and, and find their, for their own agency and build their self-efficacy and all those good things that we want to be encouraging. Um, I hope that you'll be able to enjoy, uh, uh, join us rather for some of the remaining student sessions. If you're not, be, feel free to check out the, uh, the bit.ly for the recordings and I will drop that into the chat in just a moment. I and have one, one okay. final thing I want to say, sorry, before you, <laughs> we, we end and, and Heather put it in the chat, but um, for those of you that are participating in Sustainable Jersey uh, for schools, which I think uh, a few of you are, um, we do have an open grant cycle. So the grant cycle can be used to do, you know, sustainability projects. 
and also to support, um, you know, st STEAM um, projects and, you know, uh, classroom materials and supplies and things like that. So um, check it out on our website under the grants page. We encourage um, you to take advantage of it. Carolyn's from Winslow and they've gotten a ton of money <laughs> from grants. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to learn how to do my rain garden first. So I, so every climate session, I'm writing down every single resource and I've already reached out to the Rutgers extension. Yeah, if you, if you Google uh, Rutgers water resources, um, is the group Chris Abrupta um, is there and they actually have funding to work with uh, uh, schools and municipalities uh, to build rain gardens so yeah, and so they do cool, cool designs. Have, we have a grant out the problem is we don't have any kids back in the building we're still like 90% remote. Yeah that's a challenge. Getting the kids to go out and work outside and letting the having the parents let the kids come back into the building has been the biggest uh -huh. well maybe they can build a rain garden at home if they if true if, that's true that's well no PB, i'm talking about my grant that i gotta finish oh okay wow. well <laughs> you can ask for an extension if you need it i need kids we did we're, we're working on it we just gotta get kids going but the but for the climate challenge i think i'm gonna let them come up with something creative they're home well we've got this i think good yeah, yeah and, and that climate exactly what we're talking about you know that that yes if your school is not back in person yet or some form of hybrid or allowed to be on on school grounds beyond the school day you know there are other you know kind of ways of taking action around climate change and supporting students in in you know awareness campaigns and and different type of as renee was talking about kind of uh having you know like a demonstration kind of garden installation at someone's house and being able to talk about the the uh, benefits there or um you know kind of doing some of these different action related projects that are important to them but on a smaller scale at each one of their individual houses and then compare and discuss but anyway lots of great stuff um resources out there uh, i know we're over time and i want to respect it respect everyone's um uh, other responsibilities. Uh, I think I, I'm sure our presenters would be happy to stick around for a few more minutes, but I just want to one final reminder. I threw the bit.ly in the chat, uh, all of the recordings from the summit and all of the information about the climate contest, which just opened yesterday for registration. It's kind of like a pre-registration. You just tell us that you're interested in participating so that we can make sure that we are ready for all those awesome student submissions that will come in. Um, not They're not due until June. So check it out. If you have any questions, we're happy to stick around, but thank you so much. And please don't forget to uh, do that feedback survey. It is immensely helpful to me and to the rest of our planning team as we think about how to improve for next year. So thanks so much. Um, again, I'm sure our, our presenters, I, I will speak for them and say they'll be happy to stick around for another minute or two, but I don't want anybody who uh, is, thinks that we're not done. We're, so we are done technically. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great